Blum. I'm with Electronic Data Solutions. And this morning we're going to be talking about the Trimble Mapping System. Uh, it's a new unit that was released in early December called the GO7X. And this particular unit we're talking about today happens to be the centimeter version. We'll talk about how it interacts with the laser rangefinder and also how to get real-time corrections through either a network of base stations called VRS or a single base. Uh, this webinar is going to last approximately 35 minutes. We will have a couple of poll questions to invite you to answer uh, throughout the webinar, just to kind of find out um, what your applications are and if you could make some of these products useful to you. And also, if you don't mind making a note of your questions during this webinar, um, we're going to have some time at the end of the webinar for questions and answers. I'm going to put everybody on mute. Um, so that we can't hear, you know, background noise, speakerphone noise, and so forth. So I think we're just about ready to begin. So let's start. A little bit about our company first. Electronic Data Solutions uh, has celebrated 26 years of being in business. Our headquarters happens to be in Jerome, Idaho, which is in South Central Idaho. And we currently have eight different offices in six Western states with 26 employees. And everything that we offer uh, is supported by technical support, uh, training, and repair services. So when we take on a product, we make sure to provide comprehensive service on the entire product line. Let's talk about the new Trimble GO7X. It was introduced, uh, started shipping actually the first week of December. Um, and it does include a laser rangefinder module, which you can see there in the illustration. About three years ago, Trimble purchased a laser company out of Atlanta, Georgia. And although Trimble has been offering independent standalone lasers since then, they decided to take that technology and incorporate it directly into a high accuracy handheld GPS receiver. So it's a very powerful tool because you don't have to have a separate laser rangefinder to do point feature offsets. This particular unit does come with a 3.5 cellular modem. For those of you that may be familiar with the previous models of the Trimble handheld 6000 series, the modem was an extra cost. This particular one, it's included in all the GO7 series. And the nice thing about this modem, it's an international modem, which means it can be activated on either AT&T or Verizon. And of course, the reason that folks may like to have a modem in their GPS receiver is because you can use that method to receive real-time corrections in the field. This particular unit has double the data storage of the previous model. It has four gigabytes of onboard data storage. It will support up to a 32 gigabyte SD card. So if you maximize that card storage, you can have a total of 36 gigabytes of onboard storage. This does have a 1 gigahertz processor, and we can compare that to the 600 megahertz processor of the previous model. So all the software runs much faster in this unit. And this was a great move by Trimble, in my opinion. They actually manufacture one single unit, which means all of the capabilities of submeter, decimeter, and centimeter are built into every device. So if you decide to buy a submeter unit, and then six or eight months later you decide you need better accuracy, you can pay an additional cost, and you will receive a code which will then activate firmware that's already built into the receiver, and you now have a decimeter unit. Uh, in the same way, you can even upgrade to a centimeter unit in the same hardware device. Some, some improvements on this particular model is that it is truly a multi-constellation receiver. So it's picking up all 31 of the US GPS satellites, all 24 of the GLONASS satellites. Certainly it picks up the loss correction service, which has been true with Trimble receivers for many years. It also picks up the European Galileo constellation and the Chinese compass system called Bidu. And it also is able to receive the real-time correction satellite system over Japan called QZSS. 
So with this particular unit, you can stand out in the open, and it's very common to get anywhere from 23 to 25 satellites. Uh, it's quite a remarkable device. And then to follow along with all those satellites, this particular unit has something called SBAS+. Plus. And SBAS, as many of you know, is a satellite-based augmentation system. In this country, our SBAS system happens to be WAS. So we have a system of satellites over the equator which have the ability to provide real-time corrections to your position on the ground. SBAS Plus means that it will take the WAS satellite correction signal uh, that's over North America, and it will be able to apply corrections to all the satellites in view. Now compare this to the GEO 6000 series. Uh, for those of you that may have that system, you may have experienced this. If you're out there in the field and you're picking up GPS and GLONASS, and then you activate the WAS correction service, as soon as you pick up that signal, all of the Russian satellites disappear from your sky plot. And the reason for that is that the U.S. WAS satellite constellation only had the ability to apply corrections to the U.S. GPS constellation. It wasn't able to, to apply those corrections to Russian satellites. But this particular SBAS algorithm does allow us to use and maintain all of the satellites in view while still receiving those corrections. Uh, the built-in sensors, uh, in addition to the 3.5G modem, of course, is the laser rangefinder. And it's a very powerful tool. The screenshot that you see on the slide there uh, does show you the different uh, calculations that the laser can perform all by itself. So although most people are using the laser to do a remote point feature mapping, uh, you'll notice that you can do a height calculation. So if you wanted to see how high the bridge was above the water line, you could do a two or a three shot height calculation. It would calculate that height for you. Also notice at the bottom of the screen, it can do missing line. And missing line is a function where you can take a laser shot to the left of you, you can take a laser shot to the right of you, and the missing line function will calculate the distance and the basis of bearing between those two remote points. So this particular built-in laser rangefinder has a lot of the functions of a standalone laser rangefinder. This one just happens to be built into the GPS receiver. So it does have all three sensors. It has the laser rangefinder for distance, the clinometer for the vertical angle, and of course the compass for your horizontal angle. Uh, there's a sensor calibration utility built in, which makes it incredibly easy to calibrate both the inclinometer and the compass, and we recommend that you do that every morning. And then there's a very simple additional utility built into the system that allows you to calibrate the laser so that when you point the laser at something, you're actually hitting the correct feature. So we need to talk about the accuracy, uh, because if you're starting with a submeter, a decimeter, and certainly a centimeter unit, you realize that if you do use the laser to map a point feature that for some reason you cannot occupy, that because there are some error factors in some of these sensors, you're going to be adding to the error at the final resting place of that point feature. So we have to look at the total error budget, and currently the error in the laser rangefinder is five centimeters. So when you take a shot to a remote point, you're going to get an accurate measurement that is better than two inches plus or minus. The laser will shoot 400 feet without a reflector and up to 650 feet with a reflector. However, keep this in mind. If you're going to be using a decimeter unit, then you certainly don't want to add too much error to that offset point feature. We recommend that you keep your shots under about 150 feet. The inclinometer has a error of one half a degree, and the compass has an error of 1.5 degrees. And so this really is the largest error in all three sensors. And as you know, if you're standing at a particular point in the field and you take a 50-foot shot, that horizontal angular error is going to exponentially increase as the distance goes away from you. So it's really important to keep your shots as short as possible 
in order to maximize accuracy. This particular unit has the same autofocus 5 megapixel digital camera that the 6000 series has. And of course, the nice thing about that is that it uses that 5 megapixel camera as the sighting device for the laser rangefinder. So you can actually see on the screen what you're about to shoot. And this slide illustrates that very point. Something that you can see on the screen, and for some reason did not show up on this particular slide, is sort of a square sighting device, much like a reticle that you would see if you're looking through the sight of a rifle, for instance. And that reticle basically surrounds the red dot that you can see on the screen. And that will verify for the user that before you press the fire button and actually take the laser shot, you know that you're hitting the right location. Something that I can't show you here, but you'll notice this on the screen as well, is that every time you shoot the laser, it's giving, giving you a range, a bearing, and an inclination. And as you move the unit around in your hand, those values update every single second. And if you're wondering what to do, the software was designed to make it very easy for a new user. It's reminding you to shoot the target. And that little icon in the lower right-hand corner will flash reminding you that it's now time to shoot the target. So it's a very simple thing to use. Uh, you'll notice in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, there is sort of a redo uh, symbol. That's that curved arrow. And that means that if you're not happy with the original shot that you took, you can press that redo icon on the screen or press the dash button underneath. And it will wipe out that measurement so that you can take the measurement again. And if you're happy with the measurement, you can actually tap on the check mark in the lower right-hand corner, or you can press the dash button directly underneath, and that will allow you to save the measurement and actually send that offset information directly to your data collection software. So when you're getting used to using this new technology, we do recommend that you take several shots to the same feature just to ensure that you're getting good repeatability. So we've talked about this already, the total error budget. Um, if you have a 10 centimeter handheld, then you're starting with potentially four inches of error from the start of your measuring. Uh, then you have to add um, the distance error, which is five centimeters. Then you have to add whatever error you have in your clinometer, and then of course your compass. And all of this results in a requirement to keep the shot as short as possible. Now, something interesting, and many of you probably have thought of this already, is that if you're starting with a one centimeter unit, which is really the subject of our webinar today, then you're certainly going to be adding error to that one centimeter every time you use the laser. However, you may decide that for those point features that you have to offset, uh, the lack of accuracy may be acceptable depending on your project requirements. So it's obviously better, if at all possible, to directly observe the feature so that you don't have to employ the offset capability. So this is something that we recommend strongly. Um, if you want to get a concrete idea as to what kind of accuracy, or maybe better a way to say it, what kind of error the laser might introduce, we recommend that you take your range pole and your centimeter unit and observe directly on top of a fire hydrant something that's easy to see and something that would be easy to shoot from a distance. So now you have a direct observation on that point feature. Then stand 25 feet away and collect another fire hydrant, but this time employ the offset feature. And then stand 50 feet away and then stand 100 feet away, each time shooting exactly the same point feature. So obviously if everything was perfect, you would download this data, you would apply the corrections to your field data, and you would hope that all four of these points would end up on top of each other. But of course they won't because of the additional error that you have in the measuring sensors. Uh, you'll have to decide if where those offset point features end up, uh, will, you, will you be able to use the laser effectively on that particular project? So that'll give you some concrete idea. 
So when must you actually calibrate the sensors? Uh, we actually do recommend that you calibrate both the compass and the inclinometer each morning. And when you do this, you can't be sitting in your vehicle, you can't be standing next to your truck, you can't be standing next to a large metal building. As you know, ferrous metal of all types will have an effect of, in, of imposing errors on the compass, so you need to stand away, at least 20 to 25 feet away from large metal objects in order to successfully calibrate the sensor. Um, it takes about 90 seconds. You can do it with your eyes closed. It's a very simple procedure. You simply have to turn the unit topsy-turvy in every imaginable way between your two hands, and it actually does do the calibration automatically. So why are we talking about a centimeter? For those of you that are familiar with the Trimble mapping systems, for many years we've always been talking about systems that start at five meters at worst and go down to about sub-foot at best. Well, about two years ago, Trimble decided to bring some of the much more higher accuracy abilities to some mapping systems because, frankly, GIS data capture projects, in some cases, have been requiring much higher accuracy than a foot. And so for that reason, uh, there's been a new offering, starting about two years ago this summer, actually, um, where you can now get either 10 centimeters or 1 centimeter. And it's kind of interesting because you can achieve 10 centimeters with just the handheld, but when you go to one centimeter, you must actually use the external antenna, a range pole, and some brackets. So there's a lot of reasons to get one centimeter uh, in mapping projects. Uh, you can lay out um, photo control points for aerial photogrammetry. Uh, you may want to do precise staking and layout. This system happens to produce one centimeter horizontal and one and a half centimeters vertical, so it's highly accurate vertically as well. And something I haven't mentioned yet, but many of you remember this from the Geo 6000 series, is that uh, both the Geo 6000 and the new Geo 7X unit contain an electronic barometer. And because many of you remember that the vertical capabilities of GPS is not nearly as good or accurate as the horizontal capabilities. Uh, typical relationships between horizontal to vertical would be about one to two or one to three, meaning that if you were getting 10 centimeters horizontal, you could be getting up to 30 centimeters of vertical error. And so because GPS has a very difficult time nailing down the elevations, uh, Trimble decided to put an electronic barometer built into the actual unit which of course measures barometric pressure. And with that barometric pressure reading, coupled with TerraSync centimeter software, uh, which by the way contains a geoid model, and this data geoid model happens to closely resemble mean sea level, the height above ellipsoid that GPS collects natively can successfully be transformed into a very accurate mean sea level elevation. So because of the electronic barometer and because of the geoid model that TerraSync contains, you can actually get 1.5 centimeters vertical. Compare the cost of a top-notch RTK survey system at 27,000 to the cost of a Geo 7X centimeter system at 16.5. Tremendous difference in price. And one of the reasons there is such a difference in price, even though the accuracy is very comparable, is that surveyors typically get much more expensive software that mapping and GIS folks simply don't need. And an example of that would be a least squares adjustment software, which allows a surveyor to do very precise network adjustment if they're creating a survey control network. Another example is very sophisticated post-processing software where you can turn off and on certain satellites that you decide are not as accurate. Uh, the ability to design a survey control network. So a lot of the need, and for that reason, uh, we can get a centimeter system that's much less expensive. And the good news about that whole accuracy issue is that you can actually achieve this accuracy after post-processing, or you can achieve it in the field in real time. 
So the GIS workflow is a solution that offers tremendously good centimeter accuracy now, which is fantastic. And of course, unlike a survey software program like Survey Controller or the new survey program that Trimble offers, uh, you have attribute-based data collection. So in other words, you're using your same data dictionary, or if you're a GIS person, you're using the same geo database information, which includes feature classes, domains, and coded values which allow you to tremendously and thoroughly describe the feature that you're mapping. So it has all of the GIS characteristics. Uh, the floodlight and the flight wave. Floodlight is the ability to pick up multi-constellations and the electronic barometer and the fact that there are algorithms built into the receiver itself that automatically smooth out lines when you're collecting line features and they automatically smooth out the perimeter around area features when you're collecting them. And then, of course, Flight Wave is the actual laser rangefinder. Uh, faster and simple, simpler data collection, and even in heavy tree canopy, you'll be able to get eight or nine satellites. And once again, in the open, you can pick up anywhere from 23 to 25 satellites. So here's our first polling question. Uh, it'll take just a second for this to appear on the screen, but the question here is, how much would you benefit from using a laser rangefinder to collect points? So I just launched that slide, so take a look at that and just take a couple of seconds to make a selection, and then I will share the poll results with everyone once everybody has had a chance to enter their selection. Okay, 100% of everyone has voted. Let me close this poll and share it. Uh, that's fantastic. It looks like 14% of you would use it uh, all the time. 30% uh, almost would use it often. 57% someone often. So basically, everyone attending this webinar uh, theoretically will be able to then at least sometimes take advantage of this laser rangefinder. And of course, many of you uh, have probably used laser rangefinders as a separate device which means you have uh, another set of batteries to charge, another device to carry and hold. You have to maintain a wireless connection between the laser rangefinder and the GPS unit. So this does really remove a tremendous amount of complexity uh, for the field user in having this thing built in. So let me hide this poll. And we will continue on. So let's talk about solution. Um, you can achieve one centimeter post-processed, uh, but you must be within 30 kilometers or basically, what is that, about 18 and a half miles from your base station in order to achieve um, one centimeter accuracy. Uh, same thing with a single base if you're getting real-time accuracy. So if you're not fortunate enough to live in a state or an area where there is a network of base stations, and we refer to that as a VRS, which we'll talk about in just a moment, then it's important if you want to maintain one centimeter in real time that you must be no farther than 30 kilometers from your real-time base station. So here we have the base station basically broadcasting data uh, from the radio to the rover. And of course, this entire system only works because the base station antenna and the rover antenna are looking at exactly the same satellites. So let's talk about a VRS. Uh, VRS is sort of a Trimble term, but it does describe um, a network of base stations. And for those of you that may not be familiar with this, I'll give you the basics. Um, a VRS consists of many, many survey grade base stations and a survey grade base station is defined as a survey grade antenna connected to a survey grade receiver and the phase center of that antenna is considered to be a known point. In other words, at some point a surveyor decided to survey in this antenna so that it was known to about a centimeter of accuracy on the ground. So every one of these base stations is considered to be a known point. Now, in a VRS, each of these base stations is actually broadcasting its data or sending its data to a computer 
every single second. So if you're in the field and you can get to the internet, and that's the big key to the whole system, then you can type in the IP address of that computer, the port number that's going to be streaming the data to you, and it will basically send you a customized base station file in order to apply corrections to your data. So here's how it works. Let's assume that the rover and the base stations in the VRS are all looking at the same satellites. And let's also assume that you, as a field person, are someplace inside the geographic network of these base stations. Um, an example would be the state of Washington has approximately 100 base stations. The state of Oregon has approximately 90. So if you are anywhere inside the network physically, then you're in the right place. So all of these base stations are streaming their data to a central computer. Uh, in Washington, I believe the computer is located at Seattle Public Utilities. In Oregon, the computer is located in Salem at ODOT. And when you connect to the internet, you're going to be sending a raw position from your current location to the computer. Now, many of you are very aware that raw data, and until corrections are applied, is good to about 19 or 20 feet. So you're basically telling the VRS computer that you know where you are accurate to about 20 feet. So the VRS computer says, oh, I see, you're right about here. And because you guys are probably also aware that there's something in GPS called the baseline error, and the baseline error is a linear equation that says that for every kilometer of distance between the base station and the rover, you add one millimeter of error. So what this means, if you were getting data from a single base, as the distance between those two antennas increases, your final solution has more error. Well, because in a VRS, the base station is assumed to be about 20 feet away from you, that results in basically zero error. So as long as you're standing within the physical geographic network of a VRS and you're receiving corrections from multiple stations simultaneously, you're able to achieve one centimeter accuracy very simply as soon as the correction data is sent to your rover from the computer. So it's a phenomenal thing. I'm registered both in the Oregon and Washington sites, and I've used this centimeter system uh, in many different places in the state uh, in order to get that accuracy. Now, what's the weak link here? The weak link is you must be able to get to the internet in order to receive these corrections. And the way we typically do that is through a cell phone, um, some sort of a hotspot, or through the built-in modem inside your GPS receiver. So here's a great question. Where can you get one centimeter of accuracy? Well, these receivers, uh, including the Geo7X, is really a carrier phase receiver, which means it's basically a survey grade receiver. It collects data the same way that survey receivers collect data. So to maintain one centimeter all the time, you must have a clear view of the sky. Uh, you have to maintain carrier lock as often as possible. So if you're done collecting point one, as you walk over to point number two, you have to make sure that antenna stays upright and you have to make sure it's looking at the sky. Um, in order to get this one centimeter, you must use the external antenna. We do recommend a minimum two-minute observation time on the first point, and this gives the receiver some time to figure out exactly how many of these carrier wavelengths there are between your antenna and all the satellites in view. And you'll see the accuracy go from five inches to two inches to one inch to a half an inch. And then you've got the accuracy. So that if you can then get that accuracy at point number one, you can maintain that accuracy throughout the entire day as long as you don't lose any lock with satellites. However, if you're in the trees, it will be impossible to get one centimeter of accuracy in tree canopy because the acquisition of the carrier signals are constantly broken up by the tree canopy. If you've ever talked to a surveyor who's been using RTK or one centimeter survey gear, you know they will tell you you simply can't get one centimeter in the woods. So something to think about.
So some of the options to achieve this accuracy um, in an ideal network uh, that's collecting both GPS and GLONASS, and GPS is the US constellation, GLONASS is the Russian constellation, you're picking up two frequencies from GPS, which is L1 and L2. You're picking up two frequencies from GLONASS, which is G1 and G2. Um, if you're using a single base, you've got to be within 30 kilometers. Uh, if you're using RTK or uh, a VRS signal, then TerraSync Professional does support RTCM2, RTCM3, CMR, and CMR+. And these are simply acronyms for various types of data streams that your software must support in order to properly interpret and receive these signals. Basically, it takes care of all that. There's also another way to get real-time accuracy, and this is sort of challenging. There's something called the Atuacom RTK base uh, merged or, or partnered with the Pacific Crest Radio. So we'll talk about that in just a second. But it's one way that you can get real-time corrections in the middle of nowhere. So what software should you use to collect this data? Well, that's a great question because many people use ArcGIS Mobile. Some people use ArcPad. Some people use uh, Everglade, which is a wetland delineation software. In this particular case, in order to get one centimeter, you must use the Trimble uh, TerraSync Centimeter Edition software. So what this means is that if you're using ArcPad, it will not be supported by receiving this centimeter data stream from the unit. Uh, you can still use ArcPad to get a decimeter, but you simply can't use anything else to get a centimeter. So the triple positions extensions for both ArcPad and ArcGIS Mobile are not supported by this particular level of accuracy. Um, just so you know, you can use ArcPad and ArcGIS Mobile with triple positions with other units, the decimeter unit or certainly the 6000 series and all the previous receivers. Uh, prior to that. So the reason for that is TerraSync uh, is the only software program currently of all the different programs that you can use in the field, at least in the mapping division, that has that very important geoid model. And a geoid model is really a model of the Earth based on gravity readings. And the most current geoid model released not too long ago is called Geoid 12A. And Geoid 12 stands for 2012 so it was calculated recently. Uh, that model closely mimics mean sea level. And it's able to then transform height above ellipsoid altitude references, which is how GPS thinks, or how it calculates and stores data, over to mean sea level elevations. So it's a very powerful tool. We have a municipality in the state of Washington who has been using the, a centimeter unit like this to get elevations on top of culverts. And they're able to get uh, one and a half centimeters of elevation on top of culverts. And this is the public works division, not the survey division. So a little bit about accuracy. I know many of you are thinking, gee, can I get a centimeter with just a handheld? Uh, no, you can't. In order to get one centimeter, you must use the Zephyr Model 2 antenna and this is both in real time and post-process. However, um, consider this. If you're using the centimeter handheld without an external antenna, you can still get three centimeters of accuracy with the built-in antenna. Now, that's rather crazy in a way, because how do you know that you're holding that antenna directly over the point? Because, by the way, it is a handheld receiver. But three centimeters is just under one inch, so you're still doing very good, very well. So here's a second polling question. I'll put this up on the screen in just a second. This question says, obtaining one centimeter of accuracy would allow me to do what? So when that appears on your screen, just take a couple of seconds. Looks like almost everyone has voted. I'll give you a couple of more seconds. OK, looks like we'll close this and share this with everyone so you can see what the results are. 
Looks like 17% of you said you could use this for LiDAR control. Um, a third of you said for maybe all these issues, and maybe half of you said none of the above, so you must have something else in mind, uh, which makes a lot of sense because there's a lot of good reasons to get highly accurate data. So let me hide this, and we'll kind of continue on here. Uh, this is the solution that will allow you theoretically to get uh, real-time corrections in a very, very uh, obscure location where there simply are no cell towers. And I shouldn't say that. There's probably a cell tower, but it's very weak. So one of the issues is uh, the Pacific Crest Radio. Uh, Trimble bought this company a couple of years ago, and this is a very common radio to use in order to receive real-time corrections. Uh, the radio can be mounted directly on the range pole. There's an antenna that goes on top, of course. And then there's a physical cable that goes from the radio and plugs directly into the GO7X receiver. It uses a very low frequency band, 403 to 473 megahertz. And that is significant because that particular frequency band is called a terrain following frequency. So it does have the ability to undulate successfully over all types of terrain so that you can maintain contact between the base radio and the rover radio. Now, just so you know, this radio system does require an FCC license. So you can't just turn this on wherever you want to. But as soon as you're licensed, you can get what they call an itinerant license, which allows you to monitor the frequency before you turn on the broadcast system and then you can continue to do your work uh, safely and legally. This particular radio has an IP rating of IP67, which means it's completely dustproof. It's actually submersible. So it's a very rugged field radio. So here's the other part of the equation. It's called the Atuacom RTK bridge. And this is a blue box uh, that has a couple of antennas. One antenna is to pick up a cellular signal and the other antenna is to rebroadcast that correction signal to your radio. Uh, it can be mounted on a tripod. It can be put inside your vehicle with an antenna outside the truck. The truck could be locked up, and this unit could then successfully pick up a cell signal. Interesting. Um, this Intuacom RTK bridge is so incredibly sensitive that it can see a cell tower that your cell phone cannot detect. So in other words, it's a very sophisticated piece of electronics that does have the ability to find a cell signal that, once again, your phone cannot even see. So you can experiment with this and take this out into the field. And what people typically do, they will park their vehicle up on a hill to give the antenna uh, the best reception possible. They will pick up that cell signal. That signal will then be broadcast over to the rover radio, which will then be applying real-time corrections to your solution in the field where you otherwise would not be able to get any kind of a cellular connection. So it's pretty neat. Here's a picture of a guy using it to uh, follow along a transmission line in the field. In this particular case, he has the Intuacom bridge stuck on top of a portable tripod. You'll notice the two antennas that are connected and it is broadcasting corrections to his rover radio on the pole. And here's a little closer look so you can kind of see what that looks like. And you'll notice that the XDL rover radio is plugged directly into the bottom of the Trimble handheld receiver. And that's how it's receiving its real-time corrections. So here's our last poll question. Then we're going to wrap this up. This poll question says, if I used a one centimeter mapping system, I would what? So take a look at some of that and uh, make your selection. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Everybody's voted. Let me share that with you. Looks like uh, about a third of you said you'd be using post-processed corrections. 
half of you would use uh, a couple of those selections above, maybe VRS, single base, uh, or post-processing, and then 17% all the above. And I must say this, too. We haven't really talked about this in detail, but very quickly, um, the state of Washington has a very well organized, very well managed, very secure uh, VRS. They do charge $1,900 per year per receiver in order to sign up for that data stream. However, they also will give you a 90-day free login and password to try the system out before you decide to commit funds to have a permanent subscription. Um, in the state of Oregon, we have about 90, as the entire state is not yet covered, because there are places in the state that are so remote, there's very little activity. But uh, the solution is completely free. So Oregon has no plans, at least immediately, to start charging for this service. Uh, it, that's not to say that they won't do that in the future, but for the last couple of years, it's been a free service. So if any of you are interested, I can supply you with the um, contact person so that you can sign up for that and receive those corrections. Okay, we'll hide this poll, and the last slide here. is a question, so let me do this. Uh, give me a couple of seconds here. I think we've got some people. I'm going to unmute everyone, and then if you have any questions at all, uh, please feel free to speak up, and I'll hope to answer them. Anybody? Um, that's okay. You guys, um, there's a list of all of our technical support and salespeople. Uh, Jackson Bigley is our Missoula, Montana representative. Chase Fly works out of our Jerome, Idaho office. Sean Minton is out of our Sacramento, Northern California office. I'm in our Portland office. And then um, if you want to give me a call, even if you're not in my area, uh, by the way, my area is Alaska, Western Washington, and Western Oregon. I'll be happy to refer you to the right guy within our company uh, that you can talk to. But in the meantime, um, maybe make a note of either our email address or the phone numbers, and we'll be happy to help you any way we can. Hey, Jim, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, can you add that Lisa Rangefinder on to the 7X app? After, after purchase? Yes, sir, you can. Uh, it's interesting. The, if, you, if you include the laser rangefinder with the purchase of the original unit, uh, it is around, but it gets, it's around $1,100 more. And I think you pay a slightly higher fee, maybe $1,200 if you buy it after the fact. But yes, it is, it is an add-on module that can be either added on or removed. So absolutely. Anyone else? Well, thanks very much for attending this webinar. Um, I'm going to be leaving for Bellevue uh, later this morning, and I'll be out of the office today and tomorrow, but I will be in all day Friday. Um, if you do call my phone number while I'm out of the office, it rings directly to our home office, so somebody will be able to help you regardless. In the meantime, thank you so much for attending our webinar. Uh, we'll be glad to help you any way we can, and we look forward to speaking with you. Thanks very much.